What's up, Chris with Cowdog here, and in this video I'm making a jewelry or keepsake box with mitered dovetails. The milling operation in my one car garage is a little different than most. Most of my stock is skip planed at the mill, so I'll just rip an edge with the track saw, run it through the thickness planer, and then rip the final edge on the table saw and clean it up with some hand planes. Everything is cross cut to length and since I'm trying to keep a more continuous grain flow around the box, everything will also then be labeled sequentially. Now to establish the baselines for my pins and tails, a cutting gauge is super helpful. I'm not going to spend much time on standard dovetail layout here. If you want to see how that all works out, I have a video which I'll link in the corner above. However, the thing with miter dovetails is that the layout can be a little deceiving. I was under the impression that the miter was completely separate and apart from the pins and tails when in fact the joint is a bit more complex. The cutting gauge lines for the baseline can in fact be on all four faces of both tail and pin boards, and after a FaceTime with my buddy Anthony on the subject, I realized I was basically doing it all wrong. Little inside baseball for you guys. So when I am filming and I have multiple joints to do, a lot of times what I'll actually do is cut a test joint first, just for the purpose of understanding exactly, well, number one, what the hell I'm doing, as well as how to actually film the process. So I've lined up two of my tailboards side by side. And one of the most noticeable things here is that on the end, I did not actually mark this correctly. Now you can see over here, what you end up with is actually a little bit of a half tail, so to speak. And that's gonna come off and be a compound miter inside. So essentially my pin is like a half pin miter hybrid. And then this half tail is kind of nesting into that. As far as the layout is concerned, it's actually is a little bit easier to lay out. It's just a little bit trickier to wrap your head around. Of course, to make matters worse, I had an entire brain fart here. So I ended up actually marking my uh, pins as my waist instead of the actual waist itself. Um, this is just gonna be resolved with some strategic planing. Everything actually ended up fitting for the most part fine. I think I'll have to take some material off the top but other than that, this actual test joint seems to be pretty snug or at least very usable. So to lay this out correctly, and I do wanna be clear, this would actually be a lot easier with multiple sets of dividers. I actually had broken a set of dividers a while back. Uh, just these are some cheapies off Amazon. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm gonna start on each end by measuring out my half tail. So coming from either side, I'm just gonna make a depression. And that's going to give me the spot for my half tail. <laughs> Don't get too confused with these lines here because obviously this line is incorrect. This is where my half tail is going to be. And eventually I'm just going to use my dovetail marker to drop that down to the baseline. Now the next step is to work from that depression and create essentially what you're comfortable with as far as a pin whatever looks aesthetically pleasing. I'm actually copying this from the other side. So I've just used my dividers. I'm gonna mark off that depression there. And I'm just gonna do that from either side. Same thing, mark it off with your square. And then from here, a way of coming up with your middle pin is actually kind of the same way that you would lay out standard dovetail. So you wanna come on the outside of your pin. And the idea is that you wanna walk your dividers to your next pin. So obviously this is way too short. We'll spin that out way too far. And this is just a process of trial and error, kinda of coming at it close. And you wanna make sure that you're walking to the inside that's really close. Let me just tighten this up just a smidge. That's perfect. So once you do that, you're going to come in, make a depression, woo, and then come from the other side, make a depression. Then we're going to take our 
square, line up. And that's gonna give us a perfect center pin. So tails, pins, and then this will be the miter. Now that everything's been marked in the end grain, let's come over here and we're just going to drop our marks from the end grain down onto the face. I'm just using my dovetail marker. And I think this goes without saying, but you definitely want to make sure that your dovetail marker is facing the right way when you were doing this i.e. if your lines are like this, you're not going to have a joint. Now, something to keep in mind here is in your miter, my miter is going to be cut last, so I do still want to saw this pin out, or this pin waste, I suppose, out, and I'm going to come on both sides. You could potentially just use cut on this side and then pare down, but I find that obviously taking all this material out with the coping saw is going to make the most sense and just be a lot faster. When it comes to making sure that your tailboard is tight, you want to make sure that you are square in your mortise. So here, I'm a little high on this side, which is expected. I'll just come in and lightly pare down and then just periodically check to make sure that everything is nice and square through. And that more or less did it. Kind of the same up here too. Real light passes. When it comes to chopping out the baseline waste here, I've seen a lot of Western dovetailers that like to essentially have this side facing them. As I've gotten into more Japanese style carpentry, I've found it a little bit easier actually to come from this side. And I think it's just a better body position. It allows you to be a little more over the top of it, which I feel gets your chisel in the right position to be able to go straight down. And here we're just gonna go halfway through. And I'm trying to find that little marking knife groove. And then once there, flip it around. Then at this point, I usually like to stand it upright and then I can kind of work my way across a little better. All pretty close. This one has a little bit of material on this back side. Needs to get cleaned up. And that'll do it. When it comes to marking pins out, I like to use my jack plane as a rest. It's a little bit arbitrary. You can use whichever plane you would like or even another block of some kind. And then I'm just gonna line everything up, take a clamp on the outside making sure to have contact with both the both boards. Apply just a little bit of clamping pressure, making sure everything's still nice and even. And that will give me a nice solid surface. Then I can come in with my marking knife and mark accordingly. Now with the marking knife, you don't wanna go just super hard in one pass. This is an old Christopher Schwartz trick I, uh, learned just multiple light passes to get in there now that my marking knife has uh, made its indentations there i'll just come over the top of it and mark everything out 
with a pen so that I can see everything properly. And real important here, this is your waist, not these. Uh, that's what I'm, one of the key mistakes, boneheaded mistake I made on that first corner. So mark accordingly, waist, waist, and then these are already marked. When it comes to this weird pin miter socket hybrid combo, essentially you want to make sure that you do not cross over. You're gonna treat it almost like you treat a half blind dovetail. Instead of cutting down, you wanna come in at an angle and stop before you cross into your face. So just like that, making sure that I am into my waist. And I'm tilting my saw sort of towards me and down to make sure that I'm staying up. And once I hit my baseline, then I can kind of worry about the top. And that's probably close enough. If you're liking this video, please support the channel by doing the whole like, comment, and subscribe thing, and gingerly touch the bell to receive notifications for all my future videos. You can also find me on social media, at Cowdog Craftworks, on everything. If you've seen my other videos, you know I'm not above using water to help work end grain. I actually feel as though it helps also save the sharpness of my chisels too, which just generally helps with my workflow. Also here, don't be scared to undercut your waist. You can have a bit of a V across your baseline so long as your baselines from both faces are in plane with each other. Off camera, I cut a scrap block to 45 degrees on the table saw and used that as a jig to clean up the miters that I previously sawed. Now some words for the wise, because it's certainly not from the wise in my case. If you're having trouble seating the joint, it may not be related to your waist and your baselines. Rather, it could be that you hadn't paired off enough at the miter itself. If the miters are too chunky and not meeting at a true 45, it could cause everything to get wonky on you. Just pair and test lightly and repeatedly to get your best fit. To fit a lid and bottom, I'm going with a groove that I'm cutting on the table saw. Part of the reason I went with a miter dovetail to begin with is that the groove will be hidden in the miter itself, which gives the box a much cleaner look. A flat tooth blade would have just been better for this application, but honestly the 1 8 general blade worked fine and I just shifted it over a squelch to fill out the full quarter inch groove that I wanted. I want to take a moment to chat about the Home Depot Prospective, which sponsored this video. This season, I've been linked up with Diablo Tools, and among the tools sent to me was this nifty sanding block with their sand net technology. Now, I don't always sand, for the most part, I loathe sanding. However, when there's things I don't want near my cutting tools, like dried CA glue or epoxy, sanding can be the only option. This kit comes with a dual density block, hard density for flat surfaces and soft for contours, and three grits of sand net abrasive. I was pleasantly surprised to see how fast this was able to eat through this walnut and get me to a finished ready surface. I'll have this as well as other tools used in this video linked in the description and pinned comment below. The lid and bottom are made up of this book match thin stock sapelli. I'll cut it down to size or what I thought was the correct size, more on that later, before using the router to do a 3 8 rabbit around the entirety of the edge so it fits into the groove I cut on the table saw.
The client was gifting this box to a friend and wanted a unique carved lid as well as an image of a teepee engraved in the top. Listen, it's not my idea, don't at me about it. Anyway, if you watched my first YouTube video ever, you know I've got my buddy Dusko from DP Woodworks in Miami who has actually upgraded his CNC recently and has fully gotten deep on laser engraving as well. If you haven't watched my first YouTube video ever, don't. It's pretty, pretty bad. Um, anyhow, so I had a drink or three or more and then we watched robots do my work for me, which was nice. It's all a rattling bit, so it should be three-eighths. Oops. Now, I have a confession to make, and my confession is that I am an absolute moron. I actually ended up cutting this panel um, entirely too narrow, and that is a big no-no. There's a couple of different options I have here. I could go back. I have plenty of other material to be able to make a new panel. Uh, my buddy Dusko actually lives about 25 miles away, so it's not an easy trip to say the least. And I'm not super pressed on time, but at the same time, you know, time is money and time is valuable. So I have an idea and just hear me out. So you can see here that I've got, I'm probably at least an inch off. I don't know what happened. I, I haven't the slightest idea. However, I have this corner over here this corner I mucked up with the chisel and my jig and ended up taking off a lot of material over here too much and it was gonna be a fix anyway. So based on how dovetails work and the fact that these will essentially slide in here, I think I can drop my marks all down and cut it essentially about an inch off and make sure that it fits absolutely perfectly. So the triage here could have been done at least one other way that I can think of. I was worried that trying to mark tails on a fresh pin board with the miter cut already on the tail board was going to be an absolute nightmare. So rather than just cut an inch off straight up, I can sort of extend the pins downward, which should in theory be more consistent than starting over because I can follow what I've already established. Now the Japanese pole saw here was advantageous for two reasons. Number one, my brass back dovetail saw doesn't have clearance to get to the depth I need because of said brass back. And number two, the Japanese pole saw can kind of act like a flush trim saw in a way and keep me as matched to my prior pins as possible. Since I've got floating panels and wood movement is real, I don't want the panels to just rattle all around. I decided to jerry-rig the equivalent of a space ball by using some shelf liner I had laying around. I just cut strips of it with a razor blade and fit it into the groove itself. It jams up about, a, I don't know, eighth of an inch or three sixteenths. In hindsight, I should have put it in with a dab or three of CA glue, but I ended up getting enough in there to be able to accomplish the overall goal. And no matter how many times I've done a dovetail glue up, they're always a bit stressful. 
I'm just using Type Bond 2 here. You don't need to get too crazy with the amount of glue for a couple of reasons. First, I want as little squeeze out on the inside of the box as possible because once it's together, the only other time I'm going to be able to open the box is after the glue is dry and the lid is cut. Secondly, dovetails are mechanically strong to begin with, so a ton of glue is just overkill anyway. Cutting the lid off is definitely a should have worn the brown pants moment, especially considering how much effort and work has gone into making this box already. Any slip here in this whole thing is toast. It's important to note that I take multiple light passes until there's just a smidge of material left, and then I'll go ahead and finish that with a handsaw to ultimately pop the lid. And then a low angle block plane will clean up both the lid and body of the box to give me a nicely mating surface. If you can't tell that I was eager to get things wrapped up on this project, the fact that I was working into the night should speak to that pretty easily. I wanted to get the hardware on as soon as possible in yet another high stress slash don't screw it up situation. The hardware I went with was brass stop hinges from Brusso, as well as a front latch, also in brass. In hindsight, I probably should have used their template system. My hinges and latch came out fine, but there was a ton of time burned in the setup. Ultimately, I did most of the chiseling freehand with a router plane to clean things up. If marking and chiseling weren't stressful enough, brass screws are notorious for breaking on you or stripping out. Brusso is kind enough to include a little steel screw, as well as some extra brass screws which I use to assist in the pre-drilling process. This small router plane from Veritas is a new toy of mine, and I'm a bit embarrassed to say, but I'm actually using it right out of the box. I haven't even sharpened it. Shame. Yes. With that being said, this is a pretty sweet little tool, and it helped me with the install on this latch. To set the latch in its mortise, I'm using Crackzilla from Moss Epoxies. I needed a more pointed location to apply the epoxy to, so I used cutting edge technology with a drywall screw dipped in epoxy to apply it in the top and bottom of the mortise so I can set the latch in. Off camera I whipped up this insert tray for the box, it's really just a standard mitered tray with some dividers glued in. For finish I went with one of my favorite finishes out right now which is Wood Wax from the Real Milk Paint Company. Wood Wax is their proprietary blend of walnut oil and carnauba wax which is food safe, non-toxic, and easy to apply. Wipe it on and wipe it off. As an aside, does the use of walnut oil and walnut create walnutception? Use coupon code CowdogCraftworks for a discount on their website. After a couple days of cure time, this box is done and headed to its final home next week. I'm definitely pretty pumped with how it turned out, but I'm even more excited with everything I learned on this project. 
Maybe next time I'll break out some gouges and carve the lid panel by hand. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time here at Cowdog Craftworks. Mother f That's not ideal.